What's up, everybody? Welcome into another episode of the Lawyer You Know podcast. And I'm really excited about this guest. I have these true crime experts coming on, people that follow trials, that have so much knowledge and information about what it's like to obsess over a trial or a missing person or a victim and fight to make sure the victim's story gets out there, the victims are protected, and the victims are spoken about. Because sometimes we forget about the victims in these processes, and it can be a, a really brutal time and way to look at a case. But I have Gisela from <laughs> Grizzly True Crime on here to explain to us about a case we have not followed at all on our channel and to break down a case we followed ad nauseum, it feels like. So Gisela, thank you so much for being here. Go ahead and introduce yourself. Talk about anything you want to, and we can jump right into the cases. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here. You've been on my channel a few times as well, and I know my community absolutely loves you and your channel. So, sorry, what was the question? I'm so excited. What is the question? So, so where can people find you? You have more than just the YouTube channel, Twitter, X, whatever it's called, Instagram, whatever else you have. What are your handles on there? I am so busy on YouTube. They can find me there most days. So my channel is called Grizzly True Crime, like the bear double Z, not the other Grizzly. Okay. So Grizzly True Crime. And I am also on X at True Crime Gizzler. But if they want any of my links, it's on grizzlytruecrime.com. Perfect. Perfect. And before we jump into the cases, what got you into following these cases, true crime in general? How did you become obsessed with it? Honestly, for me, I don't know if it's, I grew up in South Africa and there's a lot of crime there, unfortunately. So I think I've just always wanted to help keep people safe. So I'm always thinking of true crime in that way. For me, it was never like entertainment or just watching it casually. I'm always like, oh my word, what lessons can we learn? Mm -hmm. You know, and obviously also the poor victims, what happened to them? What were the red flags? As I say, safety lessons are very important to me. So I think that's what always got me into it. And my biological father was a police officer as well. So I guess that's got something to do with it. Cool. Yeah, yeah. Runs in the family, I guess, maybe a little bit. So the first case we're going to talk about today is Sarah Boone. The trial is happening right now. Um, when we're recording this, they're about finishing up, picking a jury, probably doing opening statements before this podcast drops. But we all know about this case as Sarah Boone and her boyfriend were playing hide and seek. And her boyfriend ends up in a suitcase. Sarah Boone may or may not have zipped it up, may or may not have left a little space for him to get out. We have new details coming out as the trial starts, which is always what happens. But he ends up passing away. She talks to cops multiple times in interrogations, says it was unintentional. She ends up getting arrested, charged with second degree murder, and is going to trial on that charge. Some interesting things have happened. She's changed her mind now. It's not unintentional. It was intentionally to protect herself in self-defense, and she's using a battered spouse syndrome defense. Additionally, we found out what the overt act was, which is necessary in a self-defense case, and that is George Torres, who is the victim in this case, Sarah Boone's boyfriend, fiance, who was in the suitcase, started to stick his fingers or part of his hand out of the suitcase, and Sarah Boone, instead of letting him get out, takes a baseball bat to his hand, and then passes out, falls asleep, leaves him in there to pass away. Additionally, she was just offered before trial a manslaughter plea deal for 15 years that she rejected. And she's already been in jail, I think, four or five years. So she wouldn't have had that much time. We do 85% here in Florida. So she wouldn't have had that much time left, could have been out, not the second degree charge, a lesser included manslaughter type charge. State offered it, Sarah Boone rejected it, and we are going and currently in trial. So that's kind of the brief synopsis of Sarah Boone. And I know you had some questions about it. So what's intriguing you about this case? What questions do you have? My first question would be when Sarah Boone put out her advert for a lawyer, were you tempted at all <laughs> to defend her? That's, that's an easy question. We're going to start off with an easy question. That No, no temptation whatsoever. So I don't do a lot of criminal law anymore. I did a lot of it the first probably five years of my practice. Uh, my dad and JD, one of my associates, does all of our criminal defense in our firm now but they were not tempted either. We, we are very choosy about what cases we take. Um, we have a, a limited kind of very boutique part of our practice that is criminal defense. We limit the case numbers. We limit the types of cases because they take a lot of time and investment. And we make sure that we give every client everything they need in those cases. On the personal injury side, we have four and a half lawyers, basically, because JD does both criminal and civil, um, that handle personal injury cases, wrongful death cases. So we're able to handle a lot more of those cases than we are on the criminal side. Um, so when it comes to this, this was not something that was really in our wheelhouse, I'll say. <laughs> yeah, we were all wondering, our community. So why do you think the state offered Sarah Boone a plea deal at this stage rather than earlier? Like, Why would they do that now? 
So, you know, that's an interesting question. I don't know that they never offered it earlier, right? I, I think that we heard from Owens, who is Sarah Boone's lawyer, and we didn't even mention that part, right? So I guess in case anybody's brand new to this case, she went through multiple public defenders and court-appointed private counsel. Some left because of her fault. Some left because of conflicts. At the end of the day, the judge determined she had forfeited her right to counsel. She puts out an ad, and a lawyer named James Owens picks up the case, brings on some of his buddies, pro bono, I guess, um, as he's representing her. And before he started representing her, if you remember, he said, deals have been offered and I'm talking to the state. I was trying to be mediator going back and forth. So I would probably guess this is a pretty average offer for a manslaughter. It's not some sweet deal. It, it's a normal amount of time, 15 years. This may have been the offer all along. That may be one of the reasons they're rejecting it is because Sarah Boone's like, I could have got this offer without a lawyer. I want something better now. Um, but at this point, I don't think it's unusual for the state to offer that. And I, I think that as I looked at these facts from the jump, it always kind of felt like a manslaughter case. I think there's enough, especially now that she's going with this self-defense that can bump it up. And maybe there was some intent to leave him in the suitcase, even self-admittedly by Sarah Boone. Um, but I think manslaughter also fits these facts. So I don't think it was an unreasonable offer by the state um, at any point in the case. And if you were her attorney, would you advise her to take it? And what happens if a client decides I'm not going to take it? Like what, what if that would be the best advice? What would you do then? So we never know everything about a case, right? As we're finding out just at the beginning of the case, we're getting details we didn't know before. So it's hard to say if I would tell her to take it or not take it because they know so much more than I do. But based on what I know, based on what I've seen, the evidence, based on reading the letters, based on reading the room, probably would have said, this is a good deal. You should take it. Um, but there's always an interesting aspect to that because if a client maintains their innocence, I would never push a client to take a plea deal and go to prison for 15 years, right? So when you ask, oh, well, if they say they don't want to take it or they push back or they're adamant, well, from my perspective, then they're the ones that make the decision. It's their life on the line. What I do with my clients is I give them my advice. I give them my best advice, but they're the ultimate decision maker. It's their life. It's their case. It's my job. Um, so while my job is to give advice, they have to make the final decision. It does happen. And in 99% of the cases, it's not a situation where I'd say, okay, that's it. I quit because you didn't take my advice and take the deal. That's not something that, that's a very, very, very rare occurrence in criminal cases. Okay. And in your observations, have you observed any risks that the state and the defense each need to be aware of in presenting their case? Risks for the state. There's some obvious risks for the defense we'll get into, but risks for the state, I think, Probably the two biggest risks are don't badger or hammer away at or go too hard on Sarah Boone. She's going to be presented to a jury who doesn't know her, who hasn't read the letters that all of us have read, that hasn't seen all the videos that we've seen. They're going to see a lot of them, um, but they're not going to come in with some of the same preconceived notions a lot of us are coming in with and have kind of an idea about Sarah Boone's personality. So if she comes off as likable, if they have some sympathy for her, she's claiming to be a battered spouse. The worst thing you could do is make them feel like you're re-victimizing her as the state and a female that's been abused by a male and the jury starts to feel bad for her and they buy into her story and why is the state being so mean? That's something you have to be careful of and that, that's a risk in this case. The second part is it's a pretty good story to tell by the state that I think the jury will get on board with um, in building up what happened. So I think they just have to be careful not to overtry the case, not to overcomplicate it, keep it simple, keep it streamlined. And also don't paint George as the perfect victim, right? He had his issues. There were issues back and forth, but he did not deserve this for all intents and purposes. She's presumed innocent going into this trial. But if I'm, if I'm speaking as the state, what I would present to the jury is while he wasn't perfect, he did not deserve this. He did not deserve what she did to him, how she treated him in the end and how she just left him there to die. On the defense side, the risks are a little more obvious. Sarah Boone is the risk. What's she going to say? What's she going to do? How is she going to act in the courtroom? What's she going to get upset about? What's she going to try to force her attorneys to do or ask or say? That's the biggest risk on their part. <laughs> That's so true. She definitely is. And with that being said, is there some coaching that goes on behind the scenes, like with the defense attorneys advising Sarah, okay, you're going to dress a certain way and speak a certain way. Does any of that happen? So I don't like the word coaching, right? But a lot of people put it out there like that. I would say preparing, yeah. right? There's a lot of preparations. We go through the evidence. We go through the testimony. We go through how everything is going to be presented to a jury. Usually we'll, we'll give some kind of advice like, hey, you want to dress professionally. You don't want to dress over the top. You don't want to dress too down. 
too far up or too far down, you know, somewhere in the middle usually works. Some clients take our advice, some don't, right? I've had clients wear stuff to court that I'm just, I can't believe that they would wear, but it happens, right? Um, from her perspective so far in the process, she's dressed professionally. I don't see anything um, negative about her appearance, but there is a lot of don't or roll your eyes or slam the table or be talking in my ear the whole time or write angrily on a pad. Try to control your emotions and your facial expressions. Have appropriate emotions and reactions, not inappropriate ones because the jury watches everything a criminal defendant does. Yes. And what is the maximum sentence that Sarah Boone could actually face for these charges? Life. Max sentence is life for her. I think the judge said 22 and a half years was the minimum she was looking at if she gets convicted. Uh, because, and that was during the discussion of the plea offer of 15 years. Um, so she's willing to take the risk. Can you imagine <laughs> if she's convicted, what that reaction would be like? The courtroom better be ready. Uh, yeah. I can't imagine her reaction. I also can't imagine Judge Kranick's comments. That'll be interesting. Yes, he's the right judge for this case. Do you agree? I agree. I, I think he's awesome. I think he's been really balanced. He's made some tough decisions. I don't think I would say I agree with every decision that he's made, but I like a decisive judge who goes and does their research, who holds the attorneys accountable and is confident in his decisions and, and moves forward. I also don't think he'll be afraid to change his mind if he feels like he did something wrong. I think he's out for justice to do this thing right and to do it once. This episode is sponsored by Blue Land, and Blue Land is on a mission to eliminate single-use plastic by reinventing cleaning essentials to be better for you and the planet with the same powerful clean you're used to. The idea is simple. They offer refillable cleaning products with a beautiful cohesive design that looks great on your counter. Fill your reusable bottles with water, drop in the tablets, and wait for them to dissolve. You'll never have to grab bulky cleaning supplies on your grocery run again, and refills start at just $2.25. You can even set up a subscription. And this was an awesome time for this to come into our lives because after the hurricane, we were having to clean up all over the house, different rooms and different things than we've ever had to clean up before. So having Blue Land partner with us and give us cleaning supplies that we can feel good about using and 225 is pretty affordable for refills, especially compared to what we're used to spending on the cleaning products we've used in the past. So from cleaning sprays to hand soap, toilet bowl cleaner and laundry tablets, all Blue Land products are made with clean ingredients you can feel good about. Blue Land is trusted in over 1 million homes, including mine. Blue Land has a special offer for listeners right now. Get 15% off your first order by going to blueland.com slash L-Y-K. You don't want to miss this. Blueland.com slash L-Y-K for 15% off. It's the full name, Blue Land, just like it sounds, dot com slash L-Y-K. 15% off. Don't miss out. And when it comes to opening statements, sometimes when we observe these trials, you know, the defense, I'm just going to say it in layman's terms, right? They they almost try too hard. Like, is do you also find sometimes less is more? That could be a good strategy. I always go for the less is more strategy. And on the civil side, what I do in my trials is more like a prosecutor in a criminal case where we are bringing the case. We have the burden of proof. We go first. We direct exam, examine all the witnesses in our case in chief first, a lot like what the state does. Um, and I try to streamline it, right? I try to make it as tight as possible, as few witnesses as I need to absolutely prove what I need to prove and as short of testimony. I don't want 20 minutes of introduction and background. Let's get to what the jury knows the case is about. What can we tell them? So yes, but I do think on the other side, sometimes it's hard as a criminal defense attorney, especially in this situation where you want to show your client you're fighting for them and doing everything for them. So you can go overboard. You can do too much and it can turn off a jury. I've talked to a lot of jurors, even since starting YouTube. Some people have reached out to me that have been jurors on trials that we've covered some we've talked to online, some just kind of off the record. And that's been a common thing they've said is the defense attorney turned them off with how he treated witnesses or, you know, overdid certain things in the case. Yes, that was one of my questions is because we observe that so much. Sometimes the defense attorneys can come across as quite condescending. And it seems like the witness just shuts down, especially if someone if someone is very well respected or something. Why is why do they do that? I mean, is there a reason for it? Is it kind of old school thinking or what is the reason that they would go with that? So it could be, and every lawyer kind of has their own demeanor and personality and way that they do things, but it's important to discredit witnesses that lack credibility and have issues, right? Cop screws up a report, doesn't do a good job investigating. A witness thought they saw something, but changes their story. It's okay. And it's your job to discredit them, but not to disrespect them. So as lawyers, you have to make sure you're towing that line and doing your job, but doing it appropriately. And I think a lot of that has to do with the lawyer's demeanor.
In one case, Chad Daybell's case with John Pryor, some of the jurors just didn't like the way that he was cross-examining certain witnesses and some of his sarcastic or condescending demeanor. And while he might make a good point, it can be lost in the delivery. So that is something you have to be really careful of as a criminal defense attorney. And I'll say your reaction to that, a lot of the people that you know are in my chat's reaction to that, trust that reaction because you guys have the viewpoint of jurors. And I can get up here and say, oh, wow, great legal point that he made, but you can completely lose it to the finder of fact and the person that matters is not me or some other lawyer being like, how good of a job did this lawyer do during this trial? But instead the jury sitting there that doesn't necessarily have legal experience and they're like, oh, dude, I feel bad for this witness. You got to be careful. Yeah, that happens. I mean, I think sometimes that's some of the value of streaming trials is like an international community. It's sort of like a virtual mock jury, you know, so you can 100%. get a feel for how people are receiving it and it could be a good training tool. Do you think, do attorneys use that as a training tool sometimes or not? It's it's a it's like a big focus group. And I would say it can be a tool. It wouldn't be the tool because everywhere's a yes. little bit different. So, you know, what people are saying in New York about a case I might try in Tampa can be something that can be instructive to me and help, but it's not really perfect in the same kind of sample size. Same thing with California or South Africa, even people have different values in different parts of the world and they find different things important, or even like gun culture is very different places. Um, so so I do think that it's helpful. It's not a perfect tool where if you were to do a focus group, you'd want to get people exactly kind of, that would be a cross section of your potential jury. But I personally love it. And it helps me a lot in picking a jury. And when I'm talking to prospective jurors and I'm asking them questions, I kind of have an idea when they get on a roll and they think and feel a certain way. I've had people in my chat that usually that means they're this type of a juror or they'll, they might be quick to a decision or they might not be quick to a decision. They may be more open to understand what reasonable doubt actually is, how high of a burden that is. So I feel like I've learned a lot from the people on YouTube, um, people like you that stream trials as non-lawyers, people in the chat that tell me, oh, I hated this expert or wow, I can't believe he got paid that much or whatever it may be has been really helpful to me. Yeah, for me, it's really great because I'm in Switzerland, obviously, and I'm South African, but I'm streaming American trials. So I find a lot of district attorneys have reached out and said it's actually valuable to look at afterwards. So it's very nice. I do like Absolutely. doing that. And I'm so glad that the USA does stream trials because other countries don't really do that. How how long did, did you live in South Africa for any number of years or 35 years? <laughs> so, so yes. How would you even describe the difference between Switzerland and South African? Just people generally culture different. What, what would you consider them different jurors and just they would look at a case differently? Possibly even okay. just with the demographics of the country. You know, it's just it's it's very the culture is the same, very friendly, very warm people. But yes, di very different um, at the same time. Yeah. And I wish I wish there was more transparency worldwide because it's really great to be able to see these trials and learn from them. And as I say, safety is something that I always want to learn from these cases. And through trials, there's so much evidence presented. It, it really helps as well for that. You probably know how the American judicial system works better than either of those two countries, right? Just from, like, <laughs> Definitely. That's, that's pretty Definitely. sad. You know, you live there. That's what's going to affect your life. Hopefully it doesn't ever. But if it ever came into your life, it would be that. It wouldn't be like this. But you know so much about our system because of the transparency and the live stream. And that's, that's what I think is important is that people whose lives are affected by these judicial systems understand how it works, understand what fair looks like, understand what's not fair, understand what their rights are. So I think that, that's a yeah. great point. I mean, here as well, when, um, for example, if a victim is murdered, they, they don't even say the victim's name. They do not say the perpetrator's name. It is completely not transparent. It's very private. So yeah, you, you literally can't learn from it. We don't have mug shots. We don't have access to court documents. We cannot see the trials and things like that. So I'm so grateful that we can in the USA. Hey, I think people take it for granted sometimes with how it works over here. Cause there's, there's bad too, right? There's good and bad, but I think overall the transparency, it just, you can't top that. That's the most important factor in a judicial system to actually make it justice, right? I mean, that that's really what we're looking for. And I think transparency is the most important part of that. And it's quite a healing process as well for everyone to see these trials because we can, you know, if one has experienced quite a lot of trauma and things, you can actually heal through observing others being held accountable for what they did to people. That's also really great. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so sorry, I went off track there a little bit. No, no, Sarah no, Boone, that's, right? That's interesting to me. <laughs> if Sarah Boone, what what if during this trial, because we've seen a bit of a pattern with her, what if she decides halfway through the trial, you know what? No, she wants to fire this attorney as well. What will happen then? Can she do that? So theoretically, yes, technically she can. But 
in most situations, a judge won't allow that, which sounds interesting to force a lawyer to keep working for a client he doesn't want to work for, to force a client to keep a lawyer she doesn't want. Now, if something unethical or horrible happens and she tells the judge, you know, he told me to flee or he told me to lie on the stand or something like that, we'll probably have a mistrial and have to deal with all sorts of things. But if it's just like, we're not getting along, he's not asking the questions I want to ask. The lawyer says it's trial strategy judge. That's kind of my department. The judge will say, you guys have to work together um, or else, you know, Sarah Boone, you represent yourself and good luck explaining to a jury why all your lawyers left. So a judge will usually for, cause we've had situations where, you know, I've, when I was a prosecutor, a criminal defense attorney tried to get off the case like a week before trial. The judge is like, no, you're going to screw the client. You've got to try the case. You've represented them for two years. I don't want to continue it again. So there are situations where judges kind of force lawyers to go on. I think that that's what would happen here, barring some, you know, explosive information that comes out. Yes, oftentimes in cases we see that if there isn't much of a defense to have, which Sarah Boone's case reminds me a little bit of that, because when those videos of the suitcase come out, I don't know what the jury's going to think of that. But if there isn't one, sometimes we feel that the defense stoops a little low and does the victim blaming and shaming thing. But do you think that can be avoided or is it sometimes a necessary strategy? It really depends on the case, right? I mean, in this case, it's def we're going to see a lot of that right? We're going to see a lot of how bad George was and how violent he was and how he, you know, punched through a glass and how he, you know, Sarah Boone had to call the cops on him. So there's going to be a lot of that because we've already heard some of it from the defense. Um, we've heard even more that they know is not going to come out on trial about potentially his family, the dangerous people in his family, whatever it may be. So there is going to be a lot of that. And when you have a battered spouse case or a self-defense case, the, the violent tend tendencies of the victim is something that's admissible. In a general case, it might not be, but in this case, it does become admissible. And again, you've got to be careful. Just like I said, a risk of the state for them feeling bad for Sarah Boone, you risk that as the defense for them feeling bad for George if you go too hard and they actually see Sarah as the aggressor. So there is going to be a lot of that. Certain cases, you have to do it when self-defense, if your person was really, if your client was really responding to the initial aggressor, that's got to become a big part of the case. But I mean, it can go awry very quickly. Yes. And, and if you were, theoretically, Sarah Boone's defense attorney, would you advise her to take the stand? I think she has to at this point. They've they've gone with the battered spouse defense. They've already admitted certain facts they can't go back on. Um, and they've already admitted that nobody else can really explain what happened to get to the battered spouse defense besides Sarah Boone. So in order to get their expert to testify, the judge has almost basically ruled he didn't say Sarah Boone has to testify. Of course, she has a right, Fifth Amendment right not to. But if she doesn't testify, it doesn't seem like they're going to be able to get into that defense or have the expert come testify. So at this point, I think their hands are tied. She has to testify. So in order to go with the battered spouse defense that they've already said they're going with, yeah, I would advise her to testify at this point. Ooh, that's going to be <laughs> quite something to see, isn't it? <laughs> oh, uh, my goodness. Imagine what that's going to be like. Is there a limit to how long? <laughs> because, you know, I think Sarah Boone could go on for a few weeks. <laughs> Is there a time limit for how long a defendant can take the stand? We've seen some that have been on the stand for three days or five days sometimes. It's quite long. So would Sarah Boone be restricted in some way or not? So usually judges won't put, especially for a criminal defendant, like a time limit on it, one day, two day, three days. The judge will try to keep the trial within the time limit, right? So if it's supposed to be a two and a half week trial and she wants to be on the stand for three weeks, Judge is going to be like, that's not okay. Your defense team said their entire case was only a week or whatever they said it was. So they'll limit it within that and they'll tell the defense that. Number one. Number two, it is limited in what she can testify about, right? It's got to be relevant. It's got to be admissible. It's got to be credible. And it's got to be something that's reliable in this trial setting. She can't just tell everybody about how awful jail is or talk about the letters that she's written to her previous attorneys. That's not going to be something that comes out. That's going to be something that the court might deem a waste of time. So if the court does limit her, it might be in what she can talk about on the stand if she starts going off on a tangents. But I would be very shocked if she's talking about relevant stuff between her and George, what happened that night, what happened afterwards, um, what she was going through, what happened before, what she was thinking, what movements she made. And that took two, three days. I don't think the judge is going to limit her on that. Wow. And I don't have too many more Sarah Boone questions, but one would be, have you observed any grounds for a mistrial or appeal yet? So, so no, I think the judge has done a really good job and the lawyers have done a good job of protecting the record with everything. The one controversial decision was obviously what I mentioned off the top that the judge found that she had constructively waived her right to counsel. 
The only appellate issue I can see stemming from that, because it's part of it's been cured since she has a full team of lawyers at this point, is the judge did not grant a continuance. So these lawyers basically had a month to prepare for a very difficult trial that other lawyers had been on for a year and a half and still said they weren't ready for trial. A lot of documents we've heard of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pages, medical records and other things, lots of data and things from computers and, and uh, uh, pictures and text messages and calls and videos. So there was a lot to do in just a month. So if anything, that's the appellate issue I see for the defense that they were just not given an appropriate amount of, amount of time to prepare a competent and effective counsel for Sarah Boone in the defense of her case. Um, that's really the only thing I see so far, but we'll keep an eye out if anything else comes up. That's actually amazing that the judge did set that limit. Like, no, the trial is happening now, even though they only had a month, these new attorneys, because in some trials we see just delay after delay after delay years go by. So is it really up to the judge? Yeah, it's, it's totally judicial discretion from my perspective. I probably would have given a small continuance, you know, maybe like two months, still get it done in this calendar year, um, but give them a little bit more time. We're already seeing issues. They don't necessarily know the documents as well as the state. Um, the state's trying to pin them down and they're like, judge, we're doing our best, but we've had the case for a couple of weeks. We've they've done multiple depositions of experts, multiple motion hearings. I mean, it's a lot of work to do in a month. Yes. I can only imagine. I hope they have lots of strong coffee yeah, <laughs> and energy exactly. even for their client. <laughs> Exactly. Yes. Yeah. We've heard from some of the other lawyers representative that maybe not the easiest client um, to have. Yes. You got anything else Absolutely. on Sarah Boone? I think, uh, I think that's all the questions I had on Sarah Boone. All right. So let's get to this Leilani Simon case, which I really had not heard anything about before you mentioned it. And I've seen some of your videos. I watched your recap video. If anybody wants to just kind of get an overview of this video, I think it was like 45 minutes. So it wasn't bad at all. Um, and I listened to everything on two times speed. So it just, I flew through <laughs> it. Um, and then I've, I've watched some of the trial and I know you're covering the entirety of the trial live streaming it. So everybody go to Grizzly True Crime to watch that. If you guys haven't already watched over there or are going to check out this case, but why don't you give us kind of a, an overview about what this case is about? And then we'll get into some of your questions and maybe some of the legal issues that are happening here. So this case, it's one of those tough ones where it's about the death of a child. And this little boy was only 20 months old. And he looked so much. He looked like his mother. I mean, it's its like she was looking in a mirror. So I don't know if that's part of her resentment for him, allegedly. But apparently, she murdered him on October 4th of 2022, or the early morning hours of October 5th of 2022. And the thing is that she was caught on surveillance going to a dumpster. And she put this 20 month old boy's body in the dumpster. And so they had to, when they figured that out, the police saw that surveillance and everything with an investigation going on, they actually had to search in a landfill for over a month. They just raked through all of that trash. And it's just so sad to think of a little boy in the trash. And they found partial remains, which of course then proved that she put him in the dumpster. So she's facing 19 charges, of which 15 are false reports to the police because she's a speculatively a pathological liar. She, I mean, when her lips are moving, she's lying and she's got a story in her head. She's made herself believe it. And that's what she's sticking to, whether she's talking to the FBI, to the police, no matter who or what. And the thing is, she was also struggling a lot with substance abuse. And so was her boyfriend as well. So I'm wondering, you know, if the defense is going to go really hard. Um, at the boyfriend at the time as well. Um, so she had actually popped out in the evening to meet up with her dealer and get some substances. And then she came back home and then she popped out again at one o'clock or so in the morning to put her baby boy's body in the dumpster. And she was a mother of three at 22 years old. This was the middle child. And the thing is, that's interesting, is she actually Safari searched. I always say Google search because Google's going to get people, but it was Safari. So she searched something along the lines of what what should a mother do if you resent your child because of how you feel about the father i mean that's also pretty telling so that's just an abbreviated version of the case as you said you watch on two times speed me too i watch everything on two times speed the video that i made is like 42 minutes long so if anyone wants the full details of the case i always like the deep dives and bullet points so they can go over there if they want to learn more about it yeah well, what else is cool is you put together a lot of cool presentations on your channel, which I, which I like. And I know maybe we'll talk about that later. Um, but yeah, so the thing that struck me about this case, obviously the brutal facts, incredibly sad, and it's just unimaginable. It's one of the things if I was a juror, which I probably never will be, but um, I would love to, I would love to do the experience. I think it'd be so cool. But just to fathom, like how could a mom 
do this. So that, that's where I would start is like, no, it's, it can't be her. Right. I mean, I, I would go in, obviously they're presumed innocent and the state has to prove the case beyond a reasonable doubt to me. And one of the first things is I'm like, you don't have to prove motive, but feels like a mom could not possibly do this to her son and then act like that and give those interviews. So you'd have to almost come to the conclusion if you think she did it to exactly what you're saying, that she's a pathological liar. And we literally just can't believe anything that she says. And from my perspective, it was so sad. Also for me, just to think about what these kids probably went through with their mom in the short time that, you know, this child lived and the other um, uh, siblings lived. It's just like, imagine what life was like if this is, you know, what happened that night. We just found out what happened that night in these facts. And it's just, I can't imagine what kids go through. And it's not just these kids. There are a lot of kids that go through this. It's just, it's a, it's a heart wrenching story um, from the jump, but I, I do think there's some interesting legal parts of the case. So let's get to your questions on it and see if we can dive into some of those. Okay. So the elephant in the room is that the state has actually said in the opening statements that they don't know the exact cause of death of Quentin Simon, because by the time they found his partial remains, of course, it was partial skeletal remains because it was, you know, in the dumpster that was, the trash was compacted and then at the landfill. So they can't prove how he was murdered. And so th I think that's really, really difficult for them. And that's uh, four out of the 19 charges is related to malice murder and felony murder and things like that. So the indictment states that she assaulted him with an object. So I'm still keen to hear in the trial, where does that evidence come from? Is there anything in the house that they find with evidence of that? Because that will then make it more interesting. Like, okay, they've got some evidence uh, for that. But at this point, I think one of the legal questions everyone would have is how how on earth is the state going to prove that she murdered him if they prove that she put his body in the dumpster that's one thing but even for the jury it's, as you said it's difficult to imagine that a mother could do this to her child and she lies like like you've never seen I mean, you just like she says look in my eyes i'm telling you the truth right now and we know it's a lie based on the evidence so if you were you know um, on the prosecuting side what what would you, how would you work around that issue? So this is one of those cases that, and we've had some other ones like, you know, Valo Daybell or um, some of the cases where the story just fits together where Occam's razor, razor, like the most simple explanation is usually true. And although there may be gaps, if I'm the prosecutor, I'm saying, here's the timeline of events. Here's all the lies. Here's all the cover-ups. It only points to one thing that she did this. She tried to cover it up. She tried to lie about it. She did this to her poor son. Um, so that that's really how you have to do it as a prosecutor is kind of the totality of the circumstances. Tell a story. Once the jury is with you, a lot of times they'll be with you completely and they'll check boxes of yes, all down the, I think there's 19 charges or something. They'll check yes, all the way down, right? Sometimes that's how it goes. But that's one of the major legal issues to me in this case is they don't really know what happened how it happened and what took place before he was put in the dumpster. And one of the issues with that is also the timing and what the remains, what was left of the remains and how, I, I think it's interesting how you said he was assaulted with an object as well. How are they going to prove that? Um, because it doesn't seem like the remains gave them a lot of information that they could use for various reasons. But, you know, they say no body, no crime. It's very difficult to prove a, a murder case without a body. Well, in this situation, you've got I mean, the motive, I think, is something they're going to say, which you can maybe talk about more. But she was just down. She was depressed. She was on drugs, mad at his dad, mad at him, maybe because, you know, she didn't feel like she was pretty anymore, that her, her current uh, boyfriend or husband was interested in her because she had, you know, all these kids or whatever it may be. But in a case like this, where they even tell you they don't know what happened to the body or how his life ended, that would be tough for me as a jury to come and vote guilty beyond a reasonable doubt that that individual crime was committed by the mom. Right. And sometimes when I'm streaming these trials, of course, everyone's engaging. And, you know, for many people, it would be that Occam's razor of like, obviously. But for a jury, that's a huge responsibility on their shoulders to then finally get in that deliberation room and say, OK, yes, <laughs> guilty, like send her away forever based on exactly what we don't know yet. Maybe by the time, I don't know, people watch this, maybe we'll know a little bit more. I'm not sure, but I do think that is an issue. Yes. And then also, as you say, the factors, I wonder if some would feel sorry for Leilani. 
She struggled with substance abuse. She was struggling with depression. She'd made a video in August of 2022 implying that she's going to be taking her own life. She had three children at the age of 22. She lost custody of two, the two of them, two boys, the daughter she still had custody of, or, well, the state, the, the CPS didn't actually, they weren't aware of the daughter at that point. But all of that, I just wonder if some jurors wouldn't be swayed to almost, you know, feel sorry for her. Although we try to always focus on the victim. We feel sorry for the victim. But there's so much here to consider in this case. Yeah, I mean, she probably did it is not good enough for guilty votes in America, right? So that that's the thing is, yeah. tell the story. She probably did it. It's only really what makes sense. That's really not enough. And I know some people aren't going to like that. But that might be why, right? A little indication of 19 charges, a lot of them um, not specifically on ending his life, might be because the state is also worried that might come back not guilty and instead guilty across the board on all those other charges. That's actually a question that my community had is why, and I'm sure they're all going to ask you as well, they're in your chat a lot, <laughs> why, if there's 15 charges relating to false reporting, would they separate them. I'm sure it's a legal process, but you will you will know the answer. Why would they make 15 separate charges instead of just one charge of false reporting or is each one for a different date? So theoretically, under the different facts and circumstances, you can charge them differently. You can charge them the same. That's just a discretion of the prosecutor. But there's usually two reasons why prosecutors may add additional charges that they legally could prove and it's legally okay and and moral and ethical for them to add on. Like a lot of times with some small offenses, you'll see a resisting arrest without violence. It's like, why did you tack that on to this drug charge or whatever it is? It gives them leverage in plea negotiations, right? So they might say, if you plead to this, we'll drop all 18 charges. We're going to drop 18, not just one charge. But we're going to drop 18 charges. So that's one of the reasons. And also with plea negotiations, as far as the years, if you stack those years on concurrently, well, now we're looking at a situation where look, you take this deal for 20 years when you could be looking at 60 or whatever it may be. It looks a lot better than you take 20 years instead of 25 years. The, the second reason is exactly what we've already mentioned in trial, if you lose the top charge, but it seems like, I'll just say, she's presumed innocent, the trial's going on. There's a lot of evidence with some of those other charges that I, I think she's going to have issues with that I'm confident the jury's going to come back with a guilty verdict on some of the lesser charges. So you have that as kind of a parachute um, if you're the prosecutor, that even if you lose the main charge, she's still going to prison for a long time. Right. That was, that's also one of the questions is this false reporting to police. I mean, some of those carry many years of sentencing, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, some of them, I, I don't know the exact amount in Georgia. I think somewhere between like five and 15 years for some of them. But if, if they stack them concurrently, I, I mean, it could be basically most of her life, if not all of it, if they're going to stack all of them on top of each other concurrently, as opposed to, sorry, consecutively stacking them on top of each other, as opposed to concurrently running them together. So if you have five years, if you have five, five year sentence run concurrently, you only serve five years. If you have five, five year sentences running uh, consecutively, it's 25 years. So it depends on yeah. how it all happens. Um, if she gets convicted, that'll be part of the sentencing process. Yes. And do you think that there is ever any defense uh, relating to being intoxicated or high or, you know, having substance abuse issues. Is there any defense for that? Like saying, because she's saying she, she blacked out. She doesn't remember anything. Is like, what can defense attorneys do with that? So you can, I guess, spoiler alert first, there's no such thing as voluntary intoxication as a defense. So if you choose to get drunk, if you choose to get high, you can't then later use that as a defense. But just for discussion's sake, if somebody drugs you or slips something in your drink, then that can be a defense. If you are, uh, you know, staying up and taking pills to stay up and you're drinking Red Bull and you stay up for 10 days straight, there can be insanity elements to those defenses. We've actually, in my office, my dad had a case and my partner, Pete Sardis, that was a Red Bull defense where a guy was drinking Red Bull, staying up days and days and days and days and ended up getting off on a self-defense claim, uh, or sorry, an insanity defense claim, and it didn't even go to trial. After wow. reading all the medical records and going through the details, the prosecutors agreed with us and ended up, he got went into treatment and he was in treatment for years and years and years before he got out. But yeah, I mean, it, it can happen, but 
usually not when you're the one making the choice, knowing the effects of alcohol and of the drugs that you're taking, and then you do something. You can't then claim blackout. I can't be responsible for my actions. And again, it's similar to a question I asked earlier about Sarah Boone. You know, if, if the defense, because they don't seem to, their defense strategy wasn't clear from the opening statements. It lasted less than five minutes. So they took the less is more approach, which I actually thought was really effective. You know, instead of overselling, I don't know, whatever, the emotional aspect of their client. But the thing is, in the home at the time, there were other people. Her, boy, her fiance at the time was in the home and he's been on the stand since and he's coming across as completely innocent. He worked with the FBI. So I think the jury would buy into that. But at the same time, we're all still wondering, but if he was there, if he was in the room, he was sleeping, how did she murder this little boy with people in the house? Her brother was in the home. You know, so the defense would be using that to their advantage, right, is my point. They would actually resort to, like, victim blaming a little bit, meaning the other victims, not just the little boy, the other people in the house. Yeah, it's it's a great point, right? All of these adults are there. The two other little kids are there. One of them, I think, was like three or four years old. None of them saw anything. None of them heard anything. None, none of them said Quentin was hurt. Um, none, none of them said mom did something to Quentin. So, I mean, I think that is an argument. <clears throat> I will say, though, I watched the opening statements as well. And yeah, it was short and sweet in five minutes. It was pure argument. Um, it wasn't at all as an opening statement should be. There was no objections, but all he did was argue. And I, I would say the defense strategy was on full display in opening statement. The defense strategy is they can't prove this. They do not have enough evidence to prove this crime. And with that lack of an evidence and the burden of beyond a reasonable doubt, you have to come back with not guilty. That is a defense strategy. It's maybe the most common and best at times, defense strategy, depending on your jury, which is why jury selection is so important. If you get jurors that understand beyond a reasonable doubt and hold the state to the burden, that can literally be the best defense you have that they didn't come anywhere near proving what actually happened to Quinn. Yes, true. Now, one huge question that everyone has in this case so far is, do you think that her mother, Leilani's mother, Billy Joe Hell, Will ever be charged? I mean, is there a reason to wait to maybe have her on the stand or something? The reason we ask is because Leilani did not have custody of her two boys. So she was not supposed to be left alone with them. And her mother, Billy Jo, had custody and she had left town. She was out of town on a business trip. So the children were exposed to Leilani's alleged violent behavior. So what, do you think there's grounds for charging the mother and why haven't they done so yet? So I, I think it's possible. I definitely think it's possible. There's child neglect charges. There are, you know, felony murder charges, even if the child neglect reaches a felony level and uh, the uh, child dies as a result of your felony or your neglect. You know, there are some ways that you could potentially get into that. Um, what I will say, though, a couple of reasons why maybe it hasn't happened yet. Number one, like you've already said, cooperating potentially, and they want her on their side. Number two, they want the the greater of most evils, right? We always say the lesser of most evils. Maybe they're going after what they consider not the biggest fish because it's not like these are celebrities, but the person with the most culpability. Um, or three, maybe they're waiting to charge her after this case. Maybe they're going to have some kind of deal in place where they charge her. She testifies. So she, you know, uh, pleads to something, no jail time, whatever it may be. Maybe there's a deal in place. So there could be a lot going on in the background that we don't know about yet, but it definitely seems like there was at least negligence on the part of the mom as well to leave the kids. And I don't know what happened in the family law case, what Leilani's past is, why she didn't have custody of her kids, why her mom did. But if there's substance abuse or physical violence or anything in the past with that, and the mom knew or should have known that leaving the kids in this situation would be dangerous, that's, that's tough. Yes, yeah. And Leilani's been arrested before for burglary and mm -hmm. you know theft to get her her substances and things like that. So I think that would be part of why she says it was a voluntary custody handover, but I'm not so sure about that because she lies a lot, of course, as we know. Uh, if you were representing Leilani Simon, what would your defense strategy be? From what I've, from what I've heard and seen, it would probably be very similar to what the defense is doing where I might get up and ask every single, because I thought it was interesting. The prosecutor said, now this was my opening and the, the evidence might not be as smooth and tracking in a path where, you know, we go one plus one plus one plus one, and maybe one witness testifying about this and that, which is interesting because I also talked to a juror from Chad Dable's case that said that would have been helpful because they weren't sure why certain witnesses were called when they were called. But anyways, 
Um, I might get up as the defense and say, uh, so what happened to Quentin before he was put in the dumpster by somebody? I don't know. Okay, thank you very much. What happened to Quentin Ford? How did Quentin die? What did whoever did this to Quentin do to him? And I would want every single witness to say, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. So then when you go into closing, you say, nobody knows. So how can you guys vote guilty? Because you would have to know beyond a reasonable doubt that she did this and not a single witness up there got up there and said they knew. So what evidence is there for you to say as a juror that you know that she's guilty and you have to know beyond a reasonable doubt? That would probably be my defense is just get a lot of I don't knows about the ultimate question and issue dealing with the highest charge. So, I mean, and during this first week of the trial where there's so many questions, you know, with people saying, but how do we know as horrifying as this thought is that she didn't put him in the dumpster alive? That's what most of the community is asking at this point, which makes sense because the state hasn't proven that yet. That's well, I mean, frankly, if they did prove that, that could be the charge, right? Because that, that still is, that would be her doing it because, you know, putting him in a dumpster to die, um, she would be responsible for ending his life. So if they could prove that, you know, that'd be helpful to their case, but it doesn't seem like they can. Right. So let's let's see if I have some more questions. I've gathered some as well from uh, all the Grizzlies, as I call my community. Awesome. So, okay, how important do you think presentation is in winning a case from timelines to dress code, body language, and communicating what needs to be communicated? So I know I could ask you the same question. This is what I was, was referring <laughs> to when I talked about this before. I love it personally. It helps me. That's a, a visual learner. Um, I So when I do opening statements or closing arguments or even sometimes in voir dire, I like to have multiple touch points with the jury, right? For them to hear something, for them to see something, maybe for them to feel something emotionally. So I like to use a PowerPoint, but I also like to mix in maybe a, a big poster board or an actual medical record or document I can put on the Elmo that'll go up on the screen. So different things. So they notice it's not just, you know, PowerPoint, 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 but I'll stop and I'll switch. And this will be an actual document or piece of evidence from the case. I'll stop and I'll switch and I'll write something on the board as I'm talking. So they're reading it, they're listening to it. Cause that I think helps, you know, burn it into a jury's memory. So many of these cases we forget because we live with the cases for years as lawyers that it's easy for us. I know that, you know, this happened on this date. She said this on this date to this cop. And she said this on this date. So a timeline, I think is one of the most valuable tools to help a jury see the big picture and understand how everything went in order. And sometimes timing is everything in telling a story. And the timeline can be the most important presentation tool that you can have as a lawyer, especially in a complicated case. That is so true. We saw that. I know you also, uh, you watched the Ashley Benefield trial. That's mm -hmm. one of those examples of the timeline just absolutely failing. Unfortunately, I mean, it wasn't clear at all. So I think in this case, Leilani Simon's trial, my goodness, the state is doing a brilliant job of presenting the timeline. I mean, the opening statements were about 90 minutes, I think it was. But it was a really comprehensive timeline, as you say, some videos, some documents, like all sorts of, all the elements were there. And I also find it interesting with the strategy of the witnesses, the order of the witnesses, as much as one can control that fully, I think, because it seems like there's scheduling issues sometimes. This yeah. prosecutor seems to be putting all the detectives on first. I think the emotional witnesses, you know, the babysitter, the mother, they're going to, I mean, they, they're coming up next. So that's a very interesting way to do it. Like the first look at the evidence that we have, now we bring in the emotional aspect. Would you say that's a good strategy, especially for this case? Yeah, you want to you want to prove she did it or she did the wrongdoing, right? And then you prove how bad it is and how it affects everybody and why the, why the jury needs to convict her, right? I think that's what they're, that's kind of how they're setting it up. And yeah, sometimes it can be very difficult with scheduling witnesses. Um, so, you know, sometimes it looks bad on the lawyer, but it's not the lawyer's fault. That does happen from time to time. Um, and, and when we talk about the opening statement, so what I found really interesting about the opening statement is if Leilani Simon would not have said one word. I don't see how the state proves this case. I don't see how they have the story. I don't see how they are even going after these charges if she just does not say a word. And so that's always interesting when defendants decide to talk, say things, do press conferences, you know, go and make up a story and tell it to the cops, which I think where she's admitted she made up at least parts of the stories that she told in other conversations with law enforcement. So, I mean, it's interesting to think about it like that and how much of her own words were used in that opening statement. 
right? And her defense attorneys must be like, man, I wish she'd lawyered up sooner, right? Because mm-hmm. she doesn't, she didn't have to say all of that. She did multiple police interviews. The FBI spoke to her. And as you say, then she spoke to the media as well, which <laughs> did not come across well. So yeah, she pretty much spoke herself into the ground. So with that in mind, would you advise someone like her to take the stand? So usually if your strategy as the defense is they can't prove the case, they don't have enough evidence, usually you don't want to put your, your client on the stand. It gives them more fodder. If the jury just hates her, they're more likely to convict. Uh, usually you want the trial to be shorter because you can say, what did they really prove? What did they put up there? They've got nothing. you know. So when you put your defendant up there, you open them up to all kinds of inconsistencies, especially she has multiple statements that are inconsistent. So they'll just impeach the potatoes out of her on the stand. And I just, I don't think it would go well for her on the stand. So in that case, I'd knowing what I know, which is very limited of the background of this case, that that's probably one I would lean against advising her to take the stand. Yes, I agree as well. I wonder sometimes, even if you advise a client not to, it's still their decision, right? So she could still decide to. Mm -hmm. That will be, that will be (laughs) quite quite interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So we shall see if that will happen. Uh, Let's see if I have any more questions about Leilani. I don't really think I do. I think that's all the questions I had for that case at this point. Of course, the trial is set to last for two to three weeks, so we've still got more to see. And I'm looking forward to your take on it, especially after the verdict is reached. Yeah, I'm really interested to see if the jury can get themselves to a guilty verdict based on the evidence the state presents. So I am really interested in that incredibly sad story. But those are the ones that really intrigue me that have this legal question of, you know, what does it actually take? What does beyond a reasonable doubt look like? And this case is going to test that, you know, this case really is going to test that um, because, you know, forensics and pictures and text messages only prove so much. And they admit in opening, they can't prove some of the biggest, most important facts in the case, even though they say they don't technically have to prove it, which is true. You can prove a case with circumstantial evidence, but it's, it is difficult. So I, I am interested in seeing that verdict. We've got about 10 minutes left. And I know when we talked originally, you said, can we talk a little bit of Richard Allen? So we can, we can do a little bonus here of some Richard Allen questions. Um, this is the Delphi case. Uh, it's been going on for years and years and years. Eventually they finally arrested Richard Allen, um, in connection with the deaths of two young girls, um, uh, Libby and Abby in Delphi, Indiana. And that trial has started. There's a million things going on in the background. We don't have time to do the summary or synopsis yeah. at this point, but for those of you that are sticking around here for the end, um, you said you had some questions on it and some things that intrigued you about the case. What are those? Yeah, I've always got some backup questions there. So as an attorney, for you observing this case, are you perceiving the the large amount of reasonable doubt that's already been created by the defense attorneys or not? So yeah, I am, but it's also been under a gag order. The judges kept cameras out. You know, we talked about transparency earlier in the episode. This case has none of it, which I don't like. I hate that. But because of that, I'm going to be careful on what I think I know about the case. I think there's a lot of details I don't know. A lot's going to come out in the trial. There are a lot of people that are actually at the trial and walking right out and talking about what happened. So that's good. Adding a little bit of transparency to the process. But as it sits right now, I think this is a case that there's going to be a lot going on in that trial that I don't know about, even though I've been following it pre-trial. Right. And the jury was selected in a day. Or so it was a day and a half or so. In your opinion, do you think that this was a little bit fast? Is it unusual or does that happen sometimes? It seems unusually fast for me. It absolutely happens sometimes, right? So it's not like this is the first time it's ever happened, but it's unusual for me based on how long the case has been around and how big the case is. Now, some people have said in the uh, county that they're actually trying the case, it wasn't as big. Okay, it's, it's bigger for the national news or international news, I guess. Okay, but what what I am happy about is it seems like the defense felt like they were able to ask all the questions, make all the objections and make all the strikes that they wanted to. And as long as they say that, then, you know, it wasn't unfair to the defense that the jury was picked quickly. So that that's really all I need. The defense knows the case better than anybody. And if the defense attorney said they were able to do everything they wanted to do in that limited amount of time, then it's fair game. Have you seen these, like the bombshell information coming out, you know, <laughs> there's all these headlines of the, the state is making many opening statements, so I'm not, can you educate us on that? Does that normally happen? And secondly, why are they sharing things like the, the defense is saying that some of the, there was hair found in one of the victim's hands and it doesn't match the DNA of the defendant? Like saying things like that before the trial even starts, is that strategic, I would assume? 
So from my perspective, I have never done or seen many opening statements done before uh, voir dire, before picking the jury. I understand that maybe because of the high profile nature, they thought it would be helpful um, for jurors that that's going to strike a chord on. You might as well let them know now and get rid of them now so we can only keep the jurors that are going to be fair and impartial and the right jurors for this case. So I guess I can understand why they do it. Most of the time it has to be done in hypotheticals. Jurors will always ask, well, I need to know what this case is about. That happens to me. And every time I'm picking the jury and we're like, well, we can't tell you the specific facts, but we can kind of, it's, it is a trucking accident case. It's dealing with a four wheeler from a company or a 18 wheeler from a company, whatever it may be. So we can give them some generic things, but not like they did not about bridge man and the bullet he left behind. And he wanted to have his way with them, but this is what he did to them. And then on the defense side, the D the hair and the hand that doesn't match his DNA. A million things could be true or give context to some of the facts that, that were given, right? There could be other DNA. It could be her own hair. We don't know anything about it, right? Um, and they don't even know certain pieces of evidence like the sketches that may or may not come in. So at this point, I just think there's so much unknown. But as far as the mini openings, very unusual. I was surprised to hear that. I don't know what effect it's going to have on the jury, right? Because I don't have a lot of experience with something like that happening. So it's hard for me to say it's going to do this or that to a jury when I don't really have anything to base that on. Right. And is it normal for, because there's a lot of comments that I received from videos that I've made about, you know, this upcoming trial and people saying, well, it's, it's normal at trials for the sketches to be excluded. Is that, is that the case? Because it's, they're saying it's hearsay, right? Usually the defense wants to uh, get rid of the sketches. Um, and there are some reasons for it. Now, <clears throat> here's what I'll say. The best evidence is the testimony of the eyewitness, right? So the best evidence is not the sketch that somebody else is making. However, because this was seven-ish years ago, that can become difficult. Memories can be faded. And again, that usually sounds worse for the state because they have the burden to prove it. But what those sketches absolutely can be used for is impeachment. Or I, I shouldn't say absolutely, right? Because a judge could disagree with me and say, no, I would be shocked and in awe if the judge did not allow the defense to ask questions to that eyewitness, right? So the one that doesn't look like Richard Allen, you could say, okay, the person you described to the cops was young, curly hair, whatever it may be. If they say no, the defense should be allowed to refresh that witness's recollection with the sketch. And if they continue to say no, it might become admissible as impeachment evidence of that witness. And so that's some ways that this type of information can become relevant and it can become evidence in a case where normally, yeah, it could be hearsay. It could be not the best evidence. There could be a lot of reasons to keep out a sketch, but it's interesting because usually the defense is the one not wanting to get the sketch in. Right. And what are your thoughts about the defendant having spent the majority of his time in a max security prison leading up to this trial? Again, this is something I hate, but when law enforcement and the judge say it's for his safety and that's the decisions that they're making, it's really difficult for lawyers to argue against that. It's really difficult for lawyers to win that. So I hate the stories I'm hearing. You know, I, obviously I don't know that they're true, but the stories I'm hearing about how he's treated, how different he looks, how different he seems, the mental breakdowns, the physical breakdowns that he's had, you know, it, it sucks to see something like that for somebody that is literally sitting there cloaked in the presumption of innocence. He is an innocent man right now until and if the jury convicts him and all of this has already happened to him before the trial even starts is really sad to think about. Yeah, and they put up like a, it's a black tent at the entrance. It seems like the back entrance of the, the courthouse so that the media, I understand protecting the jurors. So the media can't take pictures of the jurors. I get that. But they're also saying so that the media can't see the defendant. Isn't that a bit odd? Yeah, I mean, it's, again, this is a difficult thing with the judicial discretion where if the judge says it's about protection, it's about safety, it's about this or that, they have a lot of latitude about what they can do to protect all that, like the gag orders, like no cameras, um, and like some of the other measures you're talking about. Yes. And if you, if you were defending Richard Allen, what would your strategy be? And would you advise him to take the stand? So I, I just, I, again, this is one that I think a lot is happening in the background. We don't know. So I don't, I would probably say no to taking the stand. That's kind of where I would mostly lean. Um, but that could change if I knew more about the case, the strategy would be, again, the state can't prove it. It doesn't line up. The bullet, uh, science is junk science. Um, if the DNA, the hair doesn't match, there's all these things that don't actually connect to 
Richard Allen, they can't prove the case. They don't have enough evidence. Like I said, one of the most common defenses, something I would use there as well. Um, the third party culprit stuff they can't get into, which is unfortunate too. Cause I think that was a pretty good argument that the way the scene was set up, it was somebody connected with a cult or some other situation that Richard Allen had nothing to do with. There are some confessions. And I think the defense is going to go hard about why those are false confessions. I think they're going down the right line. Um, in this case that I would probably agree with based on everything that I've seen. I mean, some of the confessions include him to include him uh, confessing to killing his entire family, including grandkids that he doesn't even have. So the judge saying, yes, all the confessions are allowed in at first felt like, wow, even in the state he was in, in the prison, but actually it, it seems like a good thing for the defense, right? That yeah. all the confessions are allowed in because what he's saying doesn't even match the crime scene, you know, and correct. he's saying he killed his whole family. That's not correct either. So I think it's going to be very interesting. I wish we could see it. Yeah, he confessed to a bunch of stuff that didn't happen even with this particular crime. And that's why if a confession is coming in, the defense was probably like, all of them need to come in because just one that has some details that are correct in it, we need all these other ones that have details that are just totally not true to prove his mental state and the fact that those are not real confessions. That's not what a real confession looks like. Yes, well, thank you so much for answering all my questions. My goodness, I brought a lot of questions to pick your brain with. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you so much for coming on. And I, I really enjoy this because I know you've got a big community and they have a lot of questions. And again, they're in, in our chat all the time too. And we love seeing the Grizzlies in there. And that that's what's cool, right? Is you guys bring such a good perspective of helping explain the process to people watching and being a prospective juror and how you view things and questions that you have. Because the questions you have, sometimes the lawyers don't know that are trying the cases. We need to answer those questions of jurors. We need to know what they're thinking and what questions they have because we want to answer the big questions because we can get wrapped up in the weeds. And sometimes we need to make sure we know what people watching the trial want to know what big questions they have. So I think that's awesome that you do that, that your community does that so much. And I'm happy if I can answer any of them that you can bring back as well as you watch these trials and other trials into the future, because as you've noticed, there's so much repetition in law, similar arguments, similar fact patterns, similar things that happen um, over case to case with obviously different details. But um, this was really fun. I, I enjoyed it a lot. Thank you so much for coming on. And if anybody wants to go follow Grizzly True Crime, make sure you check it out on YouTube um, and go over there and give her a shout. Give the video a thumbs up here. Uh, make sure you guys like it. Make sure you subscribe to my channel as well. Thank you so much for being here. Till next time, we're out of here. Thanks for watching another episode of The Lawyer You Know. If you enjoyed the episode, please hit the thumbs up and share with your friends who may be interested here on YouTube. And don't forget to subscribe. You can also follow us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and TikTok. And don't forget to check out The Lawyer You Know podcast with new seasons dropping every quarter. If you have a case you want to talk to us about, if it's a personal injury case, wrongful death, catastrophic injury, car accident, or slip and fall case, please email us at lawyeryouknow at gmail.com. And of course, all these links I just mentioned are included in the description below on this episode and every episode. So until next time, this is Peter Tragos, The Lawyer You Know.